Good evening, friends. I commend you once more for your dedication to the Lord that brings you out. Very encouraging to see you. I want to continue looking at the series on the churches of Asia that that are recorded in Revelation. Most people don't realize that the book of Revelation was written to seven churches of our Lord, specifically seven churches located in Asia. And we've gone through four of them at this point, and I want to look at the one that's listed in Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, about the church at Sardis. And as is so typical in all of these, in all of these specific addresses to these churches, the Lord would take features that were, for the most part, true about the city that these people resided in, and made a spiritual application to the church that was there. And I think that's what's happening, especially when we look at Sardis, which was a city that was elevated 1,500 feet above sea level. And apparently there were at least three steep slopes around it, which made it very easy to defend against an enemy. And then you had a fourth one that could be easily defended as well. And in the history of this city, it was defeated a couple of different times. And each time it happened, it was because the people were overconfident and weren't paying attention. And it seems that Jesus would take that fact about that city and apply it, like I said, to this church and how the same thing seemed to be happening with the church in that they were becoming lazy or careless. And what is true with this church is that Jesus would warn them, he would exhort them, but then he would promise them, again, in very typical fashion. I didn't, couldn't find any real good pictures on the city itself or even this, this hill that is listed. I did find this by Brother Farrell Jenkins in his travels. And you can see in the background how that would be true of at least one of the, the, the sections of the city being easily to defend because of the steep, the steep hill that it was on. And in looking at this, I again can see that Jesus starts out by warning the church, as it says in verses 1 and 2 of Revelation chapter 3. These things says he who has seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful. And remember, and it says, I'm sorry, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. So the first thing he mentions is this fact about how they have this name for being alive, but they were dead spiritually, is how he lists it there in verse 1. And we understand that, of course, he's talking about their spiritual condition. It could be that they had this reputation of being alive because they were once a very, you know, booming church, we might say. They were, they were growing, they were active, that they had the reputation of being the standard of churches, the enviable church in the community or in the area, and other churches would look to them as a great example of what a church should be. There was a period of time when Sardis was the ideal church. They were alive, and they gained that reputation, most likely legitimately, because of the devoted members that were there at one time. Maybe they had some prominent members. But back at this time, when you mentioned the church at Sardis, most people in that area who knew Sardis would think, that's what a church of our Lord should be. They were the standard of the ideal church. They are a living church. And yet Jesus says, you have that reputation, but I can see who you really are, and you're dead. You have this name of being alive, but you are dead. And obviously the only way that can be true is spiritually. Much like what is said of the widow who fails to trust in the the Lord, as it says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 5 and 6, that you have a contrast here of a widow who really does trust in the Lord, and continues in prayers night and day, versus the widow who is totally opposite of that. She's alive physically, 
but she is dead spiritually. And so she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. Well, there's only one way that can be true, and that is you're alive physically, but dead spiritually. That's what this is building on. And really that leads us to the four quadrants we can be in. And we are in. It's not that we can be. We are in one of these. That we are either going to be alive physically and alive spiritually as we're all striving for and we all want and we all hopefully have committed to. As was said of the Ephesians. In Ephesians 2 and verse 1 that you are alive. You were once dead but now you're alive. And that of course is built on the fact that they were once dead spiritually. So we can be alive physically and alive spiritually, which is what we want. We can be alive physically or dead spiritually, as we see with this ungodly widow and as we even see with the church at Sardis. Or we can be dead physically and dead spiritually, which is referred to as the second death in Revelation 20 and verse 14, when we die physically and then we're separated from God spiritually, eternally, we are dead here and dead there. And then, of course, we can be dead here, separated from our physical body, and yet alive spiritually when we are with the Lord, which is what we all want. Revelation chapter 14 and in verse 13. And so we're all going to be in one of these quadrants at one time or another. That's true. And what we see with the church at Sardis is that they were alive physically and they even had the reputation of being alive spiritually, but they were dead. And that, of course, is a great concern for me. How does that happen? How do churches die? Now, they were still meeting. They were still a church, and he's writing to them. They, they were still identified as a church of Christ, the church of our Lord, but they were already dead. They were dying spiritually. Well, how does that happen? I, I don't believe that's true of West End. I mean, it, what if it is? I mean, would the Lord say to us that you have the reputation of being a living church, a vibrant church, a, the standard of churches in your area? But I know who you really are, and spiritually you're not there anymore. You're not committed like you used to be. I hope it wouldn't be said of us. I don't believe it would be said of us. But how could it be said of us? You know, how do churches die? What happens? And there's a lot of stuff that happens. I just want to insert a, a couple of quick thoughts here on how it could happen to hopefully encourage us not to take the same path. I don't want us to be a Sardis one day. And one good way of this happening is when God's people no longer want the truth. That's what the Bible says. That when people of God no longer desire to hear the word of God in the way it was revealed by God, and instead we're looking for people to tell us what we want to hear in religion, that's a bad path. That's a deadly path to be on. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, it says in verses 3 and 4, basically, that the time will come when they, God's people, will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears. They will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth. Still alive physically, but on the path to death spiritually. And that happens by not wanting to hear the truth. And so we always have to be open to it. I, I believe it's still welcomed here. I believe that this church wants to hear the truth. I think there are a lot of people here who, who demand to hear the truth taught from the pulpit, and I commend you for that. But we always have to be there, right? We can never reach the point where I don't want to hear something if it contradicts what I'm doing, what my family's doing, or what I want to do, or what people I know are doing. Can't, can't go there. Always open to the Word of God, even when it hurts. I believe we can die spiritually as a church when we no longer want to worship God. And I see that not necessarily by looking at a church in the New Testament, but I see that going back to God's people, the Israelites, that they were dying spiritually, and one of the qualities that were true was true in revealing that is they just did not want to worship. And when they did worship, 
They brought the stolen things and offered those things to God but kept the good stuff for themselves. Horrible, horrible trend to be in. And it says in Malachi chapter 1 and verse 13, he says, God says to these people about worship, oh, what a weariness. We have to go to worship. We have to go give God his stuff or he'll be mad at us. Oh, what a weariness to have to go and worship God. And you sneer at it is what he says. And you bring the stolen. Can you imagine? I mean, here we don't bring any animal sacrifices anymore. We're in a different covenant. We, for the most part, we bring money. Can you imagine stealing money and bringing it as an offering to the Lord? That's what they were doing with their stuff. They were bringing the stolen. They were bringing the lame. And they were bringing the sick as an offering. Should I accept this from your hand? In that context, God says, I wish there was somebody who would just bolt the doors who would just close the doors if this is going to be the attitude toward worship. And so I see, the, I see the warning there. It's always awesome to come to worship. It's always awesome to see other people who love the Lord and who want to worship in spirit and in truth. That's awesome. It's amazing. It's a grand privilege. And that's why I don't say that in vain almost every time I start out, especially on a Sunday evening. Thank you for being here. Thank you for tuning in. Those who are watching at this time, I think it's a wonderful thing for people to want to worship God. Well, we can get into, the, you know, we can get on that path of losing that desire. I believe the Bible warns us that it's possible for churches to die when we no longer want to be together, even apart from services. R Romans chapter 12 mentions how we have to be people who want to serve one another, want to share life together in practicing hospitality distributing to the needs of the saints given to hospitality well whenever a church reaches the point where its members don't even want to be together except at church don't want to see each other throughout the week that's a bad path to be on and frankly I believe it's a path that leads to spiritual death for a church it's awesome to be able to share life with the people of God but then I'll say this, at least on this thought, and that is whenever we reach the point of not wanting to share the gospel, that can, of course, be a, a path that will lead to the death of a church. Now, I am fighting allergies. I'm on the back end. I had several people ask me, do you have water up there? Yes, I do. And the main reason I want to have water up here is because two of the deacons said the, the option that I need to consider is sticking a garden hose in the baptistry and sucking on it. That's, that's their solution to me having the issues I'm having. That's Joey and Kelly. Yes, those are the ones who did that. But I'd rather do this instead. So. But what we see is that we can reach the point where we no longer, long, no longer want to share the gospel. Any church that does not care about evangelism is dying if it's not already there. It's inevitable that whenever members reach the point where they do not care if other people hear this message about finding the hope in Jesus Christ, it's over. It's a dead church. It's dying on the vine. So we have to be people who are always passionate about other people hearing the message that will set them free from the sin that is destroying their life. And so when a church is anxious about that, is ready to do that, is ready to invite and share and open up and have relationship with people in the community, you can know that church is trying to stay alive spiritually. I love what it says about the church at Antioch in Acts chapter 11, where you have a growing church. And it's a growing church because God is with that church. And the reason he was with that church is because that church was with God. They were passionate about teaching his word and in building each other up and keeping each other down the path that leads to eternal life. And so, you know, how does it happen? Something happened at Sardis. This church that was alive suddenly or eventually over time died spiritually. How did that happen? Could be the stuff we looked at. Reached the point we don't want to hear the truth. Reach the point where you don't want to worship or you don't want to serve one another or share the word of God. It could have happened that way. And certainly it can happen to us. 
But then Jesus says something else. He doesn't just warn them. That's not the end of what he says to them. He goes on to say in verses 3 and 4, in exhorting them to live a life of faithfulness. He says in verse 3, Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Now, that's a good thought right there. It's not like Jesus identifies their failure and says, you're of no use to me. I don't want you. I gave you a chance. You failed. You blew it. What we see from Jesus is he wants his people to love him in return. And he wants us to repent. So he tells these people to repent. They're still good in you. Repent. Repent, he says. But he says in verse 3, Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Now here's where it, I think... So many times, like I said, whatever happened to the city, or at least a characteristic that was true of the city, was applied spiritually to the church there. And without question, that's especially true with Sardis. When you read the history of this city, when Cyrus, many years ago, invaded this city and conquered it, two times in its history it was conquered like this. And when Cyrus did it, you can read about how easily he and his men did this by finding a secret path into the city within the wall and they walked in single file and they invaded and defeated this city at 3 o'clock in the morning. There was nobody even guarding the city because they were so confident that nobody could invade this place. So they weren't even, they weren't even setting post for people to watch. They were just overconfident. And so this leader comes in like a thief in the night and is able to wipe them out and conquer the city. Jesus uses the same imagery and applies it to the church. Here's what's happening. You guys have died. You need to wake up. You need to repent. And you need to realize if you don't take care of this, I'm going to come upon you like a thief does in the night. I'm going to come upon you like Cyrus did many years ago. We could probably say. And so he tells them, you don't know what hour I'm going to come upon you. You need to get ready, and you need to make this right. A very good lesson for all of us in our relationship with God. But here's something else that's encouraging. And that is, he says in verse 4, you have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Now here's, an, I think, a very neat thought. That even though for the most part you had the church as a whole not what they're supposed to be, Jesus says, but I see you have a few who are not like that. You have a few who are still faithful. You have a few who are still committed to the work the way I want you to be committed to. And I see that is what Jesus says to them. Now what this shows is God has always had a remnant. He always has and he always will. That when the most of the world or even most of a local church might be departing from the Lord, it's possible for there to be a few who don't take that path. It's possible for there to be a few in society who don't go the path of wickedness or the few within a family who don't take the path. of It's possible. And he's always had that. You might recall in Romans chapter 11 where it's stated in verses 4 and 5, what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed to the knee of Baal. Even so then at this present time there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Now what, the, what Paul's doing in Romans chapter 11 is he's going back to the story of 1 Kings 19 with Elijah. And you can recall how Elijah, at this point, was told by Queen Jezebel he's a dead man because of what he did to her prophets of Baal. So this queen says, I'm going to kill you. You can, you can just mark it off. You are a dead man. And in response to that, Elijah is crying to the Lord, I'm trying to do the right thing, and... Now this is the re reaction I get from the world. You might as well just take me out. I'm, only, I'm the only one trying to live right, 
And this is the kind of response I get from the world. What's the point of me even trying? And in responding to that, God tells Elijah, stop feeling sorry for yourself. Get back to work. I have work for you to do. Get up and get, get, get rid of this pity party you're having. But number two, he says, later in that chapter, Elijah, I have 7,000 people. You don't even know about them who have not bowed their knee to Baal, who are still faithful to me, get up and do your work. Now that's what God taught this man back then, and that's what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 11. That he's bringing this up saying, look, God always has a few who are willing to do the right thing. You may not know about them. You may not even know them. But God knows them. And so the point is that that's something that should encourage us whenever we feel like it's hard for us to press on. That helped me and Stephanie when we were raising our children. There were times when we had to make tough decisions in not letting them dress a certain way or engage in certain activities where there is immodesty or immorality or indecency, things like that. Couldn't let them go to any place that they wanted or that other young people were going to and they couldn't dress the way others were dressing. Not saying we, were, we failed many times over as parents, but there were times we made some tough decisions. And whenever we had to make those decisions, I would sometimes come back to this for her and for me to remember that there were other Christian parents making those same tough decisions and so we can do the same. And that's true. You, you're not the only person trying to raise your child to be modest. You're, you're not the only person who is dealing with the criticism of not letting your children go to all the other places that other people go to, especially when there's indecency and immorality involved. You're, you're not the only one. You can take comfort in knowing there are 7,000 that you don't even know about who have not bowed their knee to, knee to Baal and are faithful to the Lord. That's true in general. We can all take comfort in knowing that God always has a remnant. Even with the bulk of Sardis dead on the vine, God says, I still see a few who want to do the right thing. And obviously the point is, we have to be people who are willing to be the few. Even during his ministry, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, in verses 13 and 14, that you and I cannot take the path that is always popular. We can't always take the path where we're always going to be praised and receive the approval of the world. We have to take the path that's unpopular. Because he says in verses 13 and 14, Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. And I hope I'm looking at a whole bunch of few right now. I hope I'm looking at a whole bunch of people who are committed to being unpopular or committed to being okay without receiving the praise of men in order to exercise faith in God. That's the attitude we need to have. And that's the attitude Jesus is trying to instill in the people at Sardis who were still faithful and still serving him. He knows of our commitment to him even when others may not go along with us. Let me say one more thing. He warned them, he exhorted them, but then he promised them, as is so typical of our Lord. And he says, Revelation chapter 3, and really in verse 5, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. There are three things Jesus says to these people. If they repent, if they wake up, and if they are alert the way he tells them to be, three things are going to come your way. He says, number one, you're going to be clothed in white garments. Now what that could mean, and most likely does refer to, is the condition that describes people who are faithful unto death, who, who are victorious over this world of sin, who are loyal to the Lord, who die in the Lord, who suffer for the Lord in this life. 
In Revelation chapter 7, he says it that way in verses 13 and 14 in describing how these people will have white robes is what it says. He says in verse 13, Who are these arrayed in white robes? And where did they come from? Verse 14, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And so it's the same old story. You either want your victory now or you get your victory then. But if you suffer now, if you sacrifice your life now, I'll give you life then, is what Jesus has always taught us. And he says, I'll give you a, a white robe. And then he says in verse 5, Revelation 3, I will not blot out his name from the book of life. Now what this refers to is that cities would do a census, in a sense, by, by keeping a record of all the living citizens of a city or an area. Once you die then your name is marked out of the book of the living. That's how they kept records of, of the, their population at that time. And what God is doing is he's saying that he has a book. And this book is the book of people who are going to inherit eternal life. This is the book of life. And as he says here in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5, that if you're faithful to me, if you still remain faithful to me, I will not... Mark your name out of the book of life, which is also mentioned in Philippians 4 and in verse 3. In other words, you're going to have eternal life, and you're going to have it in definite. It's eternal life. Your name will always be in that book. And he says in Revelation chapter 3, I will confess your name before my Father and his angels. Now think about that. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10 that if we deny him before men, he is going to deny us before the Father. But if we confess him before men, he is going to confess us before the Father. And I don't believe he's simply talking about the step of salvation, which is required. We must be willing to make that great confession before men. That's certainly part of it. But I don't think that's the extent of it in Matthew chapter 10. But I think he's talking about as a whole, we have to be people who are willing to profess him even when it's unpopular, even when it's difficult, and even when it leads to persecution. We do not deny his name. And if we're committed to being that type of person, he will not deny us before the Father. Matthew chapter 10 says it this way in verses 32 and 33. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. Whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Think about that for a second. What will it be like on judgment day for Jesus to say, uh, don't know this person, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I don't know you. Who are you? What a horrible, terrifying thought that is. But the opposite of that is for Jesus to say, yes, Father, here's one of ours. This woman was faithful. Even when no one else in her family was faithful, she did not deny us. This is one of yours. Or for him to say to a faithful man, he held to the truth even when no one else would stand with him. He held to the truth even when he was rejected and slandered for doing that. He's one of ours. This person belongs to us. What a beautiful thought. What a very comforting thought. And that's the thought he's developing here in Revelation chapter 3. That if you won't deny me, I will not deny you. And in fact, I will confess you before my Father and his angels. And so I share these thoughts with us, good friends. Very important thoughts recorded for us. It's possible for churches to die. None of us like to think about it, but it can happen. And the way it happens is inwardly. It's not from some outside persecution. It's inward conditions that lead to our death. We may have a reputation of being alive, but how does God see us is an important lesson to see. And as we see with death, it's a gradual, slow process from people losing their faith. 
But even when churches have dying members, the Lord still can have a few, even in that church or in that community or in a family or a nation, who still love him and are willing to follow him even when the masses will not. And then we see that they will have their names spoken before God in heaven because they were willing to suffer for him in this life. That's a beautiful message. And I hope it's a source of encouragement for all of us tonight. It could be that you're here and you're alive physically, but you're dead spiritually because your sins have separated you from God. Well, you can leave here alive spiritually by being in Christ. If you're ready to obey the beautiful gospel that sets us free from sin, die to your sins, be buried with him in baptism, and raised to walk in newness of life. If you have done that and need to make things right with God in a public way, then we persuade you with this song as well as we stand and sing.